and welcome to the KPIT Technologies Q4 FY23 Earnings Conference Call hosted by Dollars Capital Markets Private Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Rahul Jain from Dolls Capital Markets Private Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Lizanne. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Dollars Capital, I would like to thank KPIT Technologies Limited for giving us this opportunity to hold this earning call. And now at this point, I would like to hand the conference over to Mr. Sunil Fanselkar, who is head of IR at KPIT, to do the management introductions. Over to you, Sunil. Thank you, Rahul. Good evening and a warm welcome to everyone for the Q4 FY23 uh, post earning conference call of KPIT Technologies Limited. On the call today, we have Mr. Ravi Pandit, co-founder and chairman, Mr. Kishore Patil, co-founder, CEO and MD, Mr. Sachin Tikekar, president and joint MD, Mr. Anup Sabre, full-time director and CTO, and uh, Priya Hardikar, our CFO. Uh, as we do always, we'll have the opening remarks by Mr. Ravi Pandit on uh, the year and the quarter gone by and uh, the way we look uh, at the immediate future, and then we'll have it open for questions. So once again, a very warm welcome to all of you, and I hand it over to Mr. Pandit. Good evening, and uh, welcome, and thank you for being present at our investor call. Uh, what I would like to do in my initial remarks is to give you a quick overview of the results, and um, maybe address a couple of questions which are normally raised, or which have been raised in this context. Um, and I, after that, I think we can start looking at the question answers. Um, I trust uh, you have all received our um, investor release. Um, as you would agree, it, is, um, it gives plenty of um, information. So um, you know, I, I, I believe that between the, uh, the, the, um, between the note that you have got and the initial comments, many of your questions would, have, would be addressed. <laughs> And I would um, invite you to ask any further questions that you may possibly have. So, um, as you would see that it has been a good quarter and a good year. Uh, the quarterly results uh, show a year-on-year -year growth of 50% in constant currency. And the quarter-on-quarter um, uh, -quarter growth of 8.5% in the constant currency. So, the revenue has uh, picked up well. <laughs> Uh, EBITDA, uh, we have uh, EBITDA of 19.1%, uh, which is a 60% year-on-year growth. And um, net profit, which has grown 42% year-on-year. This is about our quarterly results. When you turn to the yearly results, the year-on-year -year growth in constant currency has been 37%. Uh, the EBITDA for the year has been 18.9%. Uh, which shows a 45% growth from from last year. The net profit at uh, 3.8 billion rupees uh, shows a 39% growth over the last year. Um, <clears throat> so I trust you will agree that uh, the uh, top line as well as the bottom line growth uh, has been healthy, and we have been able to meet the expectations uh, that we set uh, through the outlook that we gave uh, to our budget. We have also given the outlook for the next year, where we believe that um, we could have a constant currency growth of between 27 to 30 percent, and our EBITDA margins would be between 19 to 21 percent. Uh, questions have been asked about uh, the genesis of this growth. 19 to 20 percent EBITDA. 21 to 20 percent. 19 to 20 percent. I'm sorry. Stand corrected. Uh, <clears throat> so. Um, I think it is important for us to dwell a bit on the growth that we had in the uh, last year and the outlook that uh, we are giving. And I think it is imperative to look at um, the underlying factors, which I would look at as uh, an intersection of two, uh, which is the industry change that is happening. And secondly, uh, our readiness 
uh, to meet the needs of our clients in this uh, period of change. As we have said time again, uh, there is a basic uh, transformation which is happening uh, in the uh, mobility industry, especially in the automotive sector. Uh, there is a change in the business model that our clients, namely the OEMs, are going through. Uh, the change is driven by multiple uh, uh, factors. Uh, there is a change in technology because of significant push towards electrification. And that is really in response to the climate change requirements. That is a key initiative for, the, for our clients. And that's a matter of passion for us uh, to really come up with solutions which are clean. The second factor uh, which is affecting is that there is a business model change that our clients are looking at. Till now, uh, the source of income for the OEMs was the one-time sale. And now our clients are looking at potentially a stream of revenues coming from the sale that is being made. And uh, so they would like to give additional functionality over a period of time. They would like to stay in touch with the client throughout the, throughout the life. And therefore the requirement of being continuous in touch and therefore need for making a change in the basic architecture. The third driver is also of course cost. Over the period as the degree of electrification has increased, the number of ECUs in the vehicles have increased. And now the, the OEMs are looking at consolidation of them. They are looking at domain controllers or centralized architecture, which would reduce the number of ECUs that make the overall uh, software management far more uh, easy. There have been multiple reports of industry analysts which have talked about significant demand for software R&D work that the OEMs will do. And the anticipation is that the OEMs will spend almost $40 40 billion dollars every year over the next five, seven years to make this transformation. So that is really the condition of the uh, industry that we face today. We have been trying for the last few years to get ourselves ready uh, to meet this industry challenge. Uh, we look at ourselves as partners to this industry and we want to be responsible and trusted partners to our clients. And with that in mind, we have been working on three or phase four major initiatives. And we believe that it is that thinking that we have put in over the last few years that is beginning to show some results. Our thinking is actually based on four broad areas where we need to um, really excel in our performance year after year. The first is really linked to our clients and our client relationships. As you all know that we have been wanting to focus not just on a single industry, but also to focus on a certain select clients within that industry. These are the clients which we call a strategy. To these clients, not only they are strategic to us, but we are also strategic to them. So we are a part of their thinking process, we are a part of their architecture development, we are a part of their problem solving. And we treat it as our responsibility to ensure that the trust that they, have, that they repose on us is well, uh, well guarded and is well um, responded to. So our focus on a few clients and going deep into their requirements has been a main driver of work of our work for the past few years. The second area is of course in the area of technology. This is an area industry in which technology is changing rapidly. Our client needs our help to get a good handle on the technology. Our motto is to be a software company which understands automotive better than any other company and to be a company which understands software better than any OEM. And with that in mind, we have been investing in understanding these technologies, developing skills in that, developing tools, platforms, accelerators, which can help our clients do their work with uh, speed, with low cost, and with absolute uh, strong systems uh, for flexibility. So our second area of uh, focus has been technology. The third area of focus has been uh, talent. And we have been investing a lot in building talent at all levels, not only at the technical talent at the bottom level, but also the managerial talent at the middle and the senior levels. And that's an area of focus that um, we believe should help us over time to come. The last and not the least important is our delivery excellence. Because the work that, um, because of the uh, engine that our, uh, uh, that our clients deliver to their customers is so complex, and the reliance on them is so high, it is important for us to deliver a software 
which is completely error free and therefore how do we develop a system or a process which can develop error free software in the right commit and time frame has been a key issue for us and we have been working on that so and we have been talking about this these four key initiatives to you with you for the last few quarters and we think that this is something that can put us in good stead that is what uh, we believe has helped us our growth in the last year and that is what we have hope that should help us in our current year in the coming year we also think that our mid term prospects in this context should be good we believe that in the current year the growth may be a little um, front end uh, and uh, so um, so we, we think that our first two quarters may do better uh, as a part of this total overall growth in this um, Uh, in the in the in the investor uh, note that we have presented we have also talked about um, a collaboration uh, you know formation of a new company called corex and i want to talk a bit about that in terms of the technology and in the rationale of that as i mentioned in this new world of software defined vehicle the middleware the core software is becoming a very important thing and we believe that there is a room for a very good sturdy core software that can be delivered to our clients for this we have found a partnership with a global well known tier one called zedef we believe that together we can develop a good solution and deliver it to our clients the company corex will be focused exclusively on the development of the software product we will continue to render services around it to this company we will be making an initial contribution of 5 million dollars and over the next 20 to 18 months we will make an extra contribution of 5 million dollars uh, the um, we have done currently an mou and we are awaiting the final clearance uh, from the regulatory authorities in germany once that is done we will be able to speak more about what will be the contribution that we can uh, from zedef over a period of time we also think that it could be useful for us to add yet another partner to that and we are in the process of conversation regarding it and whenever that happens we will certainly come back to you so these are really some of the broad observations that i wanted to make the normal observations regarding you know the staff and attrition etc have been covered in the uh, notes that we have given so with that um, uh, initial comment i would like to now open uh, uh, this uh, session to your questions thank you very much again for being with us this evening thank you Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin with the question and answer session. Anyone wishing to ask a question, may please press star in one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself in the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Chandra Mali Motia from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening, and thank you for taking my questions. Uh, my first question is on the longer-term drivers around electric mobility. It appears that the European Union will implement Euro 7 norms in mid 2025 for cars. Uh, raising the CO2 non-compliance burden for some of your customers if they are unable to comply, and the European Union also last month has reiterated its commitment to ban ICE vehicle sales starting 2035. So, in your experience working with the OEMs, how many years do you think it could take uh, to develop an affordable mass market EV in these developed markets? We're just trying to understand the length of the ongoing electric vehicle R&D cycle. um is this a short term investment cycle that could fizzle away or or is there a longer strategic focus at the oems at this point uh so thank you for the question i think uh, if you really look at uh, i mean i'll give you the first the broad answer i think uh, first the first one to really go for the uh, uh, proper uh, uh, regulations and compliance uh, on this uh yeah uh, some of the companies in us have adopted it and many of them will be adopting it uh then japanese companies first have gone for uh, more hybrid and then also electric as a combined focus so there have been stages so overall the different markets will come up 
uh, maybe mature and uh, will invest differently. Important to that is also you have to look at the commercial vehicle market, which is uh, uh, still uh, in the early stages of electrification. And uh, it, there are many technologies which are uh, coming up, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, maturing, which will be fuel cell, hydrogen, uh, of course, uh, uh, battery technologies. Uh, so I think uh, there will be continuously an investment into this area. Coming back to passenger cycle, I, uh, what we see with our clients is uh, typically this, uh, these are, uh, early, I mean, if you just look at uh, basic uh, engine technology and the engines have been there for more than 100 years, and uh, there is still new uh, uh, new innovation happens every time. So actually in electrification also, there are many things which will happen. I mean, it will be on different components and also in terms of charging and other infrastructure. So we believe that uh, it will be much longer uh, cycle and uh, at least uh, I would say the technologies will evolve at least for a decade, if not more. Got it. That's helpful. Uh, my second question is on the cyclicality of R&D spending at the OEMs. Uh, historically, mm -hmm. automakers have invested in R&D projects throughout macro cycles as is visible from their annual filings over the past sort of 10 to 15 years. There is also a school of thought that R&D spending could be a discretionary spending item for these companies if they want to preserve margins in, in a down cycle. So could you share your thoughts on this as well, please? Yeah, so there are uh, basically two specific things in this area. First is, uh, while it is uh, called R&D, uh, largely what we are focusing on is development and engineering. And uh, this is actually a real production program, uh, right? Uh, just because all the new, it is all about new technology. And this is all about new architecture, uh, many new technologies being introduced, and uh, more importantly, integration of uh, many of these domains. Um, so uh, while it is classified as uh, uh, R&D, it is largely a development engineering for a specific production program or development program. Uh, as you know, all the, uh, the one of the most important team for, for the OEM is uh, their brand and their market share in their uh, respective uh, key areas of focus. And uh, if, uh, uh, if, the, uh, if the OEMs, basically the current concern is if they do not come up with these architectures, as you know, there are already some companies who are quite, uh, I've already introduced that they will lose the market share. So this is not, uh, uh, you know, as much discretionary as people think. It is actually more a committed expenditure. There are different budgets which have been taken out, and uh, I don't. I think uh, uh, all the clients would like to introduce the product at the earliest to gain a early early mover advantage or get more market uh, market share. That's helpful. Uh, thank you very much, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pratap Maliwal from Mount Infra Finance Private Limited. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, am I audible, please? Yes. Yeah. Hi, and congratulations on a good set of numbers, and thank you for taking my question. I just wanted to ask around our margin guidance of 20%. So what margin levels do we have going ahead? Because with the mega deals that we've announced, they may initially have some kind of on-site presence that may be needed. So uh, could you just help me understand some of the margin levels to get to that 20% uh, mark uh, going ahead now? So there are, uh, I would uh, first uh, say that we are given a, a range between 19 to 20%. And if you look at last uh, many years, uh, I think we have improved our margins uh, generally quarter on quarter, but uh, certainly year on year. And uh, it has been a very sustainable growth in the margin. Uh, what we have been saying specifically is uh, uh, we, uh, we would, of course, like to keep on improving the margin. And we had given a, about a three-year window a uh, few years back that when we will exceed a 20% uh, uh, goal. So in next, uh, uh, you know, in a couple of years, we should be over 20%. The main thing what we are saying is uh, the way we operate is we have a certain margin. In, like uh, once we get to 19% uh, now or 20%, the 
additional investment we reinvest into the growth area, whether it is into new technologies, that there are so many technologies coming up uh, proactively to focus on that. So we continue to grow and remain at the uh, forefront uh, of uh, our technology uh, roadmap of the plant. Uh, or uh, whether we invest into people or we invest into infrastructure. Uh, so that is how we make the decision. And as we get more comfortable around that, looking at our investment, then uh, you know the margins go up. So it is a cycle which is a combination of what we look at is the margin plus the investment we make. As you may be knowing that uh, uh, probably as a uh, technology services company, we spent a fair amount of uh, uh, money into uh, research and development, which uh, uh, we do report to. So uh, th that is how we look at uh, our margin and investments. Okay, sure, sir. Thank you for that. Now, just another question. Uh, if I heard correctly, that we believe that our growth in FI24 may be front-ended for the first two quarters. So, could I just understand what would be driving this? Because our Technica acquisition, Technica seems to have positive seasonality in Q3 and Q4, the second half. So, why would our uh, growth be front-ended now for FI24? And if you could maybe help me with the Technica growth numbers, because I believe it's uh, overperformed some of our expectations. So, if you could just call that out, please. So uh, there are two uh, points I would like to consider. Uh, I would like to mention mm, the first about Technica is uh, we do not give a uh, because it is a fully integrated uh, entity. We would not give uh, the the way it has uh, performed better when we means is it's a seasonality and we thought uh, we were expecting the revenues to go down, but they did not go down, which was a factor. So it is not that they have exceeded the performance from that part, they exceeded the performance from the expectation perspective. So they maintain what it is there. From the seasonality perspective, what we mention is our quad H1 will be stronger is what we mention, And it is on the back of the couple of large engagements we have won. And what we would like to do as a company is we would like to ramp up as quickly as possible. And uh, that's what, uh, and we would like to maximize uh, that in the first part. Uh, that is what we meant, and uh, that uh, that doesn't mean what will be, uh, you know, the H2, we will not have growth or anything, it is not that the point. We will have the normal growth, but I think if you look at uh, the significant growth we had for three quarters, I think what we are mentioning is uh, H1 will be stronger from that perspective. Okay, sure, sir. thank you for taking my question, I'll get back in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vimal Gohil from Alchemy Capital Management Private Limited. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. So my question on EV. One of the one of the questions on EV has been answered. Um, I just wanted one bookkeeping question to be answered, which is uh, the contribution that you've had from FMS uh, this quarter. I believe that we've started integrating the same. Uh, just wanted to get a sense on how has it performed because uh, it's been quite some time since we, since we acquired it. So vis-a-vis -vis our expectations, uh, how has it performed? How have their top plants performed? Uh, if you could give, give us some uh, details there. Thank you. So uh, there is no addition of SMS revenues uh, into these quarters numbers. That will happen uh, uh, in Q1. Uh, so there is no uh, change in the ownership of SMS, SMS as of this quarter. Nothing has been added. The performance uh, of uh, that entity per se is in line with what we had expected when we had done the initial stake acquisition. But there is no revenue that is added this quarter from SMS. It will happen from next quarter. So uh, in this quarter, uh, so on a Q1Q basis, the entire 12% is uh, completely organic? That is correct. It is 100% organic. All right. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is on the line of Nitin Padmanabhan from Investec. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, uh, great quarter. Um, Thank you. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Uh, so one is, uh, I, I think a few years ago, I, I think you mentioned that, you know, $500 million is a target over the, over the next couple of years. You seem to have already uh, on that uh, on that number, and uh, you have possibly added capability through those years uh, through acquisitions or partnerships. Uh, I just wanted your thoughts on 
uh, in terms of capability set uh, when you look at uh, the broad set of competition that is out there how would you compare in terms of the breadth of capability that you have with competition uh, uh, and how many companies uh, uh, would have that kind of breadth uh, the second question was that uh in, when you look forward in, in terms of the next leg of the journey uh what is it that you'll really need to add in terms of capability and uh, are or do you think a significant part of that capability build out is already in there uh right uh, so those are the two questions and uh, lastly uh, uh from uh, you mentioned that the initial half of the year will be stronger um as these deals ramp up do you do you, do you think that they'll be initially margin dilutive to start with or uh, or or, or uh, it wouldn't be uh, so those are the three questions thank you so i will uh, and most of the questions i'll remember i'll start first i will answer your third question which uh, let me put it that it will not be margin dilutive um, the growth will not be margin dilutive um, uh, then uh, the first uh, your question was about uh, the competition uh we look at uh, competition multiple ways uh, and uh, i uh, i have said it again but more importantly what uh, we see that resonating with our clients is there are uh, uh, we, we are in a very unique uh, position uh, currently uh, where uh, because of three things one is a, a very strong focus on um, automotive and mobility the second is uh, real focus on uh, integration and uh, software integration and the systems integration and uh, the third part is uh, the breadth uh, of the domains uh, across so in all these three things uh, i uh, i may say we are reasonably uniquely positioned um, uh, on that uh, while we do expect that uh, the competition will always be there but uh, we believe we are uh, uh, we are uh, uh, if i would say ahead in the curve and we'll continue to invest and uh, uh, you know make uh, that differentiation uh, go further uh, that's uh, how i see it um, and uh, 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 the other part what we are trying to do as you would say uh, that every six months three months six months you will see that uh, we are making some moves uh, and uh, which are uh, uh, again uniquely in the industry maybe you can look at uh, what we are doing right now uh, creating an independent company for productizing which will uh, create a lot of opportunity for kpid by itself in terms of integration but more in, in terms of standardization in the industry so i think uh, we believe very uh, very we feel very good about it and uh, i think uh, the focus uh, and the uh, trusted partnerships uh, we have uh, with the client um, along with the, uh, the capabilities which we have built put us in a unique uh, spot what is your third question <laughs> Uh, so capability is uh, <laughs> it is very interesting question because i think the markets are moving very uh, fast in terms of technology adoption i think uh, we have to be on our uh, feet uh, and every month two months I, I, we see few things which are coming up so the way we look at it is uh, in two buckets one is we keep on looking at technologies which are uh, will will be here and now which will get adopted into uh, the vehicles the second what we do as a part of the city organization uh, and uh, otherwise is uh, uh, work on technologies which will get adopted uh, three years down the line uh, in both the parts uh, we do see uh, uh, sometimes new opportunities about i mean new technologies coming up there are areas where we will have to work on uh, of course uh, uh while we have uh, capabilities as you know autonomous or other areas are very in, uh, important part and uh, very areas of strain for us uh, but we do believe some of the areas in terms of cloud uh, ai analytics for this specific domain not a generic skills for this specific domain uh, will be an area which uh, we are investing internally uh, very significantly and maybe uh, maybe scaled uh, uh, more in future Sure, that's helpful. Uh, thank you so much, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Mohit Jain from Anandraki. Please go ahead. 
sir two questions one was on the deal pipeline like we obviously have one few large deals last year but how are things there at the end of fourth quarter versus say last year or last quarter and the second one related to the sharp increase on the tnm side so is it fair to say that some of these large deals and the ramp ups that we have witnessed they are more on time and material side and incrementally we should see less of fixed price and therefore uh, despite having more tnm we should still expect significant margin expansion ahead uh, hi hi mohit uh, this is sachin tikeker in terms of the the engagements and the pipeline uh, you may have noticed that over the last quarter we have consistently shown growth and um, you know we we believe that the 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 trend will continue uh, in in the new year um specifically uh, uh there are two types so you heard of two specific announcements uh, about reno as well as honda um similar kinds of things have been happening with many of our other oem t25 clients over the years it's just that some of them have been happening incrementally and some of them have happened and we didn't announce them or the client didn't want us to announce them um so from that perspective i think there were unique situations when we specifically came out and talked specifically about honda and reno the point that i'm trying to make is um our focus continues to be on these t25 clients and um uh, as mr patil explained earlier on uh, the focus is to go deep and wide as they are as they go through the transformation as we engage with them de uh, deeper and wider um we are seeing more and more areas where um they need help and we are actually building capabilities to sort of uh, uh, provide uh, uh, help in different areas so one point is you know earlier we were a, it was about one practice uh, getting into it now uh, there are collective practices uh, going into it and so forth and the third part is we are also uh, in order to solve some of their larger problems we are also counting on some of our ecosystem alliances uh to provide larger solutions um i know it's kind of a long answer to your short question but i do hope that it throws some light on it and if you could please add something on us side like we have been doing large deals across europe say or japan in this case but what is happening on the us oem side yeah maybe pipeline uh, maybe something expected in 24 anything will help uh, uh, absolutely and then we'll come back to your uh, tnm question yes. um uh, specifically uh, us uh, we had a reasonable growth in in us uh, during the last year this year also we expect robust growth from our existing clients um uh, especially the oems and uh, uh, they continue to go through transformation as you know electrification goals uh, us companies also oems have also set up electrification goals they also have their road map in terms of uh, level of uh, autonomy that they want to build and most importantly in order to sort of uh, change their model and engagement with their consumers uh, they are also trying to build some models so um, along these lines uh, are we see more and more engagements uh, with the existing clients that we have uh, in the us and on the west coast as you know there are certain uh, new oems that are coming up Uh, we are working with two or three of them um uh, these are early days and we'll 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 see how things unfold with them but that's the additional uh, part in the us uh, that we thought we should uh, sort of bring to your notice but overall net net uh, uh, we're going to see fairly balanced growth across the three geographies some geographies will do slightly better than the others but you, you know we see uh, fairly robust growth across the three geographies now about your uh, specific questions on the tnm side you're 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 right that uh, it has actually gone up and the reason is there are three or four transformational programs that we have started especially what you may call uh, software defined vehicles or software defined mobility programs as you know these are the programs that everybody is uh, doing for the first time so there is no precedence to it and it in order to um, define what needs to be done we have to work very closely with the client in terms of what needs to get done and this process can take up to a year uh, and during the course so to us um, tnm or fixed price is just a commercial understanding please know that the the type of engagement remains the same which is 
we are taking accountability for the work that we are doing. Right? So we are accountable for the work that we are doing for them in, in the software-defined vehicle. It's just that things are not defined. It's more on uh, DNM. As they get more defined, uh, we can move some of that into um, uh, fixed price. But the nature of the engagement doesn't change, uh, Mohit. Understood. And sir, DNM also goes in sync with higher on-site, or it, it could be like DNM goes up, but my offshore also remains. Uh, it's not necessarily it's fairly balanced, and uh, even if it, it's not very noticeable. You know, the, uh, as I mentioned, it, it takes about a year. Uh, so during the course of the year, it's about the same at the end of the day. Understood, sir. Thank you very much, Mithal. Thank you, Mohit. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Deepak Rao from Cuba Asset Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, congratulations, Ravi, uh, Kishore, Sachin, Anup, and the, and the family. Awesome results, you know. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, uh, so my first question is, uh, I think you dwelled on the CTO organization's uh, work, but my specific question is, uh, what, in the areas of semiconductors, in the area of uh, hydrogen fuel uh, vehicles, in the area of um, transportation domains adjacent to your present subverticals, uh, what's been the competency development, what is the business development uh, 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 actions, and essentially what is the market saying, you know, and what are, you, what are you doing to address those things? Hi, uh, so uh, I will uh, take one by one. I think uh, from a semicon uh, perspective, we believe that uh, our relationship with the semiconductor companies and our ability to uh, interact with them, uh, discuss with them, and create solutions with them are very critical for our strategic customers, which are largely OEMs. So we are uh, basically um, making sure that we are aware of the roadmap, we are aware of all the new developments that are happening in this space relevant to our industry, and especially our strategic customers. So that is the, from a semiconductor perspective. From a hydrogen fuel perspective, I think it is um, there are two elements of hydrogen fuel. Hydrogen fuel being used in combustion engines and hydrogen fuel being used in fuel cells. In both of these areas, we are in uh, you know very much uh, in the technology. We understand the elements of uh, what goes inside. We have experimented a lot with that. And uh, as this uh, activity shape up with our customers, we are in a very good position to handle them. As far as transformation into adjacencies, uh, I presume you are talking more about uh, other uh, relevant areas like uh, uh, electric railways, vehicle take or something. Yeah, something. Pardon? Railways or off-roading or whatever. Railways, 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 vertical, uh, vertical takeoff. We believe uh, that uh, in the current industry that we are operating and the current circumstances that we have, this, that means huge amount of changes happening, multiple dimensions of uh, changes happening in the automotive space, uh, the passenger car and the commercial vehicle space, that there is enough on the plate for next uh, couple of years. So we, are, we will uh, focus on what our customer uh, strategy customer requirements are, what are the technology gaps that they have, what are the problems that they have, and focus on the solutions for that. At, uh, so I'll just add uh, to what Anup mentioned. Uh, is, uh, so uh, in all these three areas, we are already seeing even the initial technologies, like even in case of hydrogen or this, uh, we are seeing early signs of integration business coming up uh, at a vehicle level, et cetera. Uh, so it, uh, even in semicon, basically it is about the integration of the middleware uh, and uh, you know at a lower level integration of the software and uh, semicon. So uh, we see those opportunity. But uh, coming back to your question on adjacencies, uh, uh, as uh, we see a longer term, uh, uh, you know, demand uh, in, uh, uh, in with our clients and uh, our uh, uh, area of focus. Uh, we will initiate something uh, uh, during the year, uh, end of the year or early next year, where uh, we will start exploring adjacencies. But uh, uh, that uh, uh, we may not take it up uh, uh, as soon, but uh, we'll start uh, maybe seeding uh, certain technologies or maybe some efforts uh, 
next year in next couple of years yeah got it uh, yeah it's uh, focus is good um the second question i have is the uh, kpit zf product as the kpit does the services part uh obviously you talk about it but what is your what is the thought behind if it's a standardized product how will your client a european client or honda or you know be able to differentiate between other car manufacturers if they are using a standardized product you know yes uh, so uh, let me define what a middleware is uh, from a definition perspective right so middleware is the essential component of software that sits between the application and the hardware you know to very sim- simple definition for it uh, this part of what software we are talking about the middleware uh, has to make the life of the application development easier but that means that the middleware is the most complex piece of software and it is like a fundamental infrastructure for you know the application software to run in now when we basically talk about standardization in this piece of software does not mean that it deprives the oem to create a differentiation through the application software so if you look at how uh, each oem will uh, derive their strategy or drive their strategy in terms of differentiation will be through application software and the calibration of application software and uh, that has really uh, nothing to do with how the middleware is standardized in fact the standardization of middleware would make their life easier in terms of launching their application software faster into the vehicle Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure following your story and your journey. You know, thanks and uh, congratulations once again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Sharma from MC Pro Research. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Congratulations on good set of numbers. Uh, Thank you. Two questions. Uh, what kind of employee addition you are looking for, given the uh, the guidance of 27 to 30 percent uh, in FY24? and how do you see utilization levels to reach there so the first thing is that at a high level we do not uh, do not uh, really report on uh, these parameters this is because we give a very clear uh, outlook for the revenue we talked about the programs so we talked about uh, the flexibility in that as long as we manage the revenues and the margins uh, i think uh, that that's how we would like you to look at it but overall at at a, at a company level i mean just to give you a historical uh, reference uh, last uh, year uh, we were about 8200 uh, this year we are uh, 11000 plus so uh, addition of about 35% uh, or so uh, for the na- and we, what we do is uh, uh, you know running two quarters uh, we do a very detailed uh, we have a revenue visibility and we do a detailed planning uh, based on that and uh, that's that's how we planning but uh, coming back to your uh, question so i think we see a very strong uh, 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 strong uh, uh, requirement for the uh, what the talent and uh, we basically address it to a couple of means uh, one is the uh, freshers we take and we have to improve we keep on improving the quality in terms of different places in india and outside india and uh, that uh, of course uh, is something which uh, we uh, we try to increase but we are looking at the complexity of our uh, pro- programs we are not in a we we cannot uh, absorb as much as uh, some of the our uh, you know uh, uh, it companies can do so uh, so i think uh, that is one point the second point is the attrition which uh, has uh, come down Uh, significantly uh, for last many quarters we are at uh, mid teens and uh, and we expect uh, that to continue if not go down uh, so i think the, that uh, also is a very important factor when we look at uh, how many people will hire and how we can what we can do so based on this too we plan the thing uh, and uh, we we actually feel the environment is much better than the last year for us to hire and uh, uh, have the enough uh, talent to deliver to our uh, uh, our commitments 
Uh, understood. And uh, one bookkeeping question. So your employee cost uh, went up significantly in this quarter. So is there a one-time item or there is some shift towards uh, higher uh, wage costs going ahead? It is purely based on headcount addition for the, the group, the employee cost. Your quarter-on-quarter -quarter cost is what you referred, right? Yeah, so so even if I look at uh, per employee basis cost as well, it seems to have gone up uh, around 8% uh, QNQ. So we're just trying to understand uh, if uh, something abnormal one time item is there or new additions are at higher uh, cost. Some colorful would be helpful. So, so uh, see, there is, a, of course, there is a growth in uh, the employee number and per employee, I understand your question is more about per employee cost. So we have uh, promotions uh, which are there every quarter and uh, it more or less depends on that and also on the mix of hiring. So there is nothing which is one time or uh, abnormal uh, in this quarter. Uh, it is just a part of the regular uh, promotion cycles and the lateral hiring that we have done during the quarter. Understood. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Deval Cha from RBSE Investment Managers. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, am I ready? Yes, Deval. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, so my question pertains to more on the competition. So I was just trying to understand uh, where this industry competitive landscape is going. So while I completely understand that next six, seven years, we have a uh, debt which probably is unique in the industry. But uh, there could be a chance that the OEM might, uh, you know, developing their own uh, in-house capability. Like I, I have read somewhere that Volkswagen has created a, a company also for vehicle OS uh, by the name of uh, Carrier or so, and they already have a 6,000 employees working under that. So what? How this? Uh, com so is there a chance that the that the technology company could emerge from the OEM uh, circle only? And at the same time, uh, the, the following question on that is that uh, probably uh, like what Microsoft OS is very prominent in the, uh, in the PCs, could there be a chance in future where there is, would be a one vehicle OS product which will be used by many of the OEMs uh, in order to have a standardization and on, that, on top of that the software will be built. So just wanted to understand your thought on this. David, your absolutely your observation is uh, on the money. The competition landscape is changing. If you look at the ecosystem uh, of the industry from chip to cloud and everybody in between, uh, everybody is trying to figure out what their role is uh, given the dis disruption brought in by software. And uh, now everybody is trying to get that little piece of software in there. So it's an evolving um, uh, trend and everybody is trying to figure out where they can create value and how they can make money. Um, uh, having said that, uh, we are a software company, and um, our, our, uh, uh, as you said, we do have a head start, um, and you're saying five to seven years, we appreciate that, uh, but we, we do believe that there is a head start, and we need to continue to hone our skills and get close to the OEMs as, uh, as much as possible, and that's exactly what we've been doing. If you look at how OEMs perceive us, they see us as their software integrator. So we are closer to them uh, so that we can help them define their roadmap uh, towards SDV and beyond and uh, sort of help them not, not only define it but also execute it where the bulk of the uh, business actually uh, comes. Um, so it's an evolving um, uh, landscape. And uh, to your point, in some ways, uh, to us, um, um, other than the OEM, everybody is a competitor or uh, an alliance, uh, correct? So it's a, and it will keep on evolving over a period of time. And that's why we made a very conscious decision to really focus more and more on the OEMs and work with them uh, in a trusted partnership manner. Your second question was um, on the OEMs building their own uh, software capabilities. And if you look at uh, OEMs till about few years ago did not have software capabilities. They actually got hardware and software bundled together from some of the last year ones. So they didn't keep as much software with them. And it's, it's, some of it is going to be their differentiator as they desegregate software from hardware. Um, it's important that they build core capabilities 
um, of their own in future. And uh, you're seeing that, I mean, Carrier is one example, if, but if you look at most of the large OEM, that's the case with some of them. And some of them were actually software companies that became automotive companies on top, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like um, And this is like any other business, if that's going to be a differentiator, you need to build core capabilities. It's just that the work of software is going to be so much that they may not be able to do everything on their own uh, you know, not now, not in future, because it may not make sense. What they will do is what's going to be core to them, and everything else, um, our guess is they're going to trust uh, their key partners to do for them. So that's that's not just the trend for today, but that will continue to be the trend uh, in future. So that's about uh, your question on the OEMs, and the last part was about whether there is going to be so you, you gave an example of uh, Microsoft uh, operating system, which is uh, so essentially whether anything is going to get commoditized, right? In in some ways, that's what you're referring to. Not not and exactly commoditized. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, not exactly yeah. commoditized. It's more about uh, having the central OS system will which will have you know cornered the entire market and upon which the uh, entire PC uh, industry was evolved. So in that sense, I was coming. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, the automotive OEM is a small world, and uh, in some areas that can happen. And um, uh, Mr. Sabri was our CTO who talked about Quarix in that regard. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, the middleware and architecture, and some of the OEMs will uh, go in that way. Uh, and having said that, that may happen. However, the, the, the application feature, which continues to be a differentiator, that's going to be the poor amount of poor work that OEMs will have to continue to do in future, and they may have to depend on, you know, partners like us to get that done. Okay, and, and that is the reason even I am excited to know more about your colleagues. So, um, quarters, probably after two, three quarters, you uh, may want to give us some more insight on your colleagues. Uh, and, and just one thing, uh, on the employee, so just a very basic question. So uh, when I look at your employee cost, I, I understand it's uh, quite, quite higher than the whatever the other industry player may not be your exact competitor. Uh, so is it because of the, we are paying a higher amount for our uh, niche tech uh, talent, or it's, it's a more of a front loading kind of, uh, uh, we are keep building up the capability and, and probably in future we'll have that operating leverage kicking in. So, what is the scenario? Is that all? Yeah, I think uh, there are two, three points in that. Uh, one is uh, naturally uh, we had to uh, we had to be a net uh, talent creator because of the uh, you know the size and the scale we have in this domain uh, and the growth we are having. Uh, mm -hmm. So from that perspective, uh, really for uh, talent. Uh, uh, or other competition, we look at it more from uh, tier one and uh, some of the OEMs and some technology companies. So to some extent, uh, we have to provide a very quick growth for the deserving uh, candidates. So uh, so that is uh, point number one. But uh, the important point is, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, freshers uh, which uh, we can induct into the overall ecosystem is uh, uh, probably uh, lesser than uh, many companies go like 75-80% uh, while uh, mm -hmm. they are uh, yeah, more towards 35 40%. And maybe we have to do a better job on that over the period we will do that. But uh, that uh, also increases our cost. But uh, our realization, our uh, contribution per person and those ratios uh, are better in that case. Okay. Thank you, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question is from the line of Saurabh Sadwani from Sahasrar Capital. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello, good evening. Um, so, uh, our revenue per development employee for this uh, quarter has jumped significantly. And if I look at it, Historically, we have been at fifty thousand dollars, and now it we went down to around forty-one thousand, and now we are at forty-eight thousand. 
So I wanted to understand what happened in this quarter. Uh, was it uh, high volumes or was it a better pricing? And uh, what other factors do affect uh, this number? So if you look at the movement of uh, the uh, per employee revenue, yes, it has moved uh, in the range that you mentioned. So uh, we had said last year, if you look at it, there was a shift from uh, onset to offshore for some of the large engagements we had earlier started. And that was the reason why the uh, revenue per employee went down. Uh, if you look at now, uh, this quarter, and of course last quarter also, I think it was up from the earlier quarter. Uh, see the hirings, if you look at uh, the last uh, year, uh, at least at the first two, three quarters, uh, the hiring was very strong uh, as compared to the growth. And now we are uh, looking at improving what you can you may call as utilization, but really the net realization that we have per uh, person, which is a mix of uh, our uh, rates, our utilization ratios, and also the uh, amount of uh, used assets that we can use in delivery and all of those things. So I think it's a combination of these factors that has uh, resulted in the increase in per person revenue. Okay. And, and just a clarification, uh, when, when you talked about uh, the middleware, so uh, the middleware is like a uh, Linux kernel on which uh, people build Ubuntu and Fedora desktop, so that way OEMs will build their Fedoras and Ubuntu on that, right? Is that what you're trying to build? Uh, slightly, slightly uh, maybe a, a little bit of technically deficient comparison. Uh, Ubuntu and Fedora are somewhat like a distribution of Linux. That means uh, they are very specifically supported as Linux versions. Whereas you could think about this as a Microsoft Word or a PowerPoint on top of uh, Windows. You know, so Windows is actually like a middleware and the office uh, that you see on top or any application, additional application on the top is what we call as application, the OEM application. Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, I think, so, sir, uh, just one more question. So I wanted to understand, um, right now, what is the situation on middleware? It, is it not standardized much or how are OEMs doing that now, right now? Uh, see, uh, the, uh, in the past, uh, there was no concept uh, of middleware for the reason that the architecture was a distributed architecture and the way that the OEM sourced uh, electronics or software was primarily through uh, sourcing a electronic control unit or a hardware including software from a tier one. In the, in the future, what is going to happen is uh, the OEM, because it wants an integrated software uh, or a uh, integrated user experience inside the vehicle, and I can give you an example, is for example, if you use a voice assist feature and you want to open your uh, boot uh, based on a voice command. So in the previous case, it was difficult because the boot uh, controller used to come from a different tier one and the voice recognition uh, device used to come from a different tier one. So there is a lot of money that was money and pain that was being spent on integrating these two together. Now in the new scheme of things, most of these application software that will open the boot as well as which will recognize the voice will be an application developed by the OEM themselves. So it will be easier for them to integrate this together to create a great experience for the user. And that is where the new architectures are moving. And that's the main change that is happening in the industry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you very much.